Okay, thanks very much, Fanula, and thanks very much, everyone. I'm very honoured to be here in West Cork. It's actually my first time in West Cork, believe it or not. And I'm very happy to be speaking about a West Cork man, uh, Florence McCarthy, uh, or as he was born, Fiona McDonough McCarthy Reich. But I'm going to go with Florence McCarthy. Um, what I've been asked to speak about today, going on the theme of Ireland and Europe, is Florence's relationship with Spain. Now, I did my master's thesis on Florence McCarthy many years ago, I finished in 2003. And at that time, I would have told you, if you'd asked me, that Florence McCarthy was a, a chieftain, like a, a warlord, really, of, of, of the era. And he would, have he would have been prepared to side with anyone, including the English, including Hugh O'Neill, including the Spanish, to basically consolidate his position here in southwest Munster. But when I was looking over uh, my research for this talk, I had to come to a different conclusion. Because actually, Florence McCarthy's ties with Spain go back to his earliest days. They're while I don't have the Spanish side of the story, they're of a sufficiently deep character to show me that Florence McCarthy is in contact with Spain the whole time. And as we'll see in the context of late 16th century Europe, what this means is, as well as being a warlord, as well as being a chieftain, a Gaelic Irish chieftain, Florence McCarthy is really taking a side in what's a kind of a European civil war. So he's described, this is by George Carew, the Lord President, which was like the governor of Munster, as a, a man greatly addicted to the brute sort of these remote parts, that's West Cork, <laughs> and to the company of Spaniards. Now, addicted doesn't mean what we, it means, you know, supportive in 16th century English. Now, I'll do a, a brief kind of overview before I get into the specifics. So, Florence McCarthy is from the McCarthy Rea family of Carberry, okay, so not, not quite this part of the world, but he claims a much greater title, which is McCarthy Moore the supremacy over all the McCarthys. Now, I'll explain in a little bit what that means. He is a subtle and conniving intriguer. So just when you think you know what Florence is about, and this is mostly based on his correspondence with the English authorities, Florence changes course. So he's prepared to back the English at times. He's prepared to back what we might call the rebel Irish, what the English called at the time, the rebel Irish at times. Uh, he can never quite grasp what he's doing. But this is the nature of the beast. This is 16th century Ireland. Sometimes the English authorities are, are fulsome in their praise of Florence McCarthy, that he wears English clothes, that he speaks the English language, that he lived in London for quite a lot of his life, and not through a choice of his, I'll come to. He lived in Dublin for a little while. But sometimes they're fulsome in their praise because they think he's an enabler of their policy, which is the Anglicization of the province, the, the settling, what they call the Reformation. And at this time, they're talking about the civil reformation, not the religious reformation of the province. But at other times, and what I now think is the scales fall from their eyes, and they realize that Florence McCarthy is actually a major obstacle to the English project in Munster. So this is not Florence McCarthy, because as far as I know, there isn't a picture of him. This is the last undisputed McCarthy Moore. So this is Donald McCarthy Moore. Now, there are three Donalds in this story. This is the first Donal. Pay attention to the Donalds, okay? I'll, I'll flag them for you. But there's three... There, it's, it's actually more complicated than this, but essentially, there's three main McCarthy lordships. The overlord, if you like, of southwest Munster, underneath North Kerry and a great swathe of, of North Cork and Tipperary where the Fitzgeralds of Desmond ruled, is the McCarthy more supremacy area. But it's much more complicated than that. First of all, there's two more McCarthy uh, families. There's the McCarthy's Reich, which of which Florence is a member, and there's the McCarthy's in Muscree. Now, they practice what in English is known as coin and livery, what the English uh, depicted as barbarous exactions. Now, what this meant is that if you're a chieftain of an area, it's not so much that you own the land, it's that you have a supremacy over the people. You get to extract resources from them, like taxes, uh, but they also have to serve in your forces. So the coin is, you know, it's usually not coin, it's usually subsistence goods, uh, but they have to pay you tribute. They have to put you up when you travel around the territory. They also have to serve in your forces. This is called livery. So they have to serve in what in Irish is called a rising out. Now, you might conclude that they were a bunch of warlords, which they were, but they were, what the contradiction is that they were also highly cultured people, as Thomas went into in the last talk. So Florence, as I'll get to in a second, speaks four languages. He's able to intrigue in all of these languages equally. Um, and he has interactions, extensive interactions, really, with kind of a, a Cold War in continental Europe. Now, this is, this is not the best map, so sorry about the visuals here, but this is basically the McCarthy the area of McCarthy's supremacy, I would say. Now, 
it won't linger on it because the image isn't that great. But as you can see, the shaded areas of the McCarthy things, it's much more complicated than owning just all the land. These are all different branches of the McCarthy's as well. And the McCarthy's also have a supremacy over people like the O'Sullivan's, who were right down the end here. The Barry family and the Roach family are descended from what we call the Normans, but what they called the Old English. And for just before the time when Florence becomes important, the, the most important dynasty is the Fitzgeralds of Desmond. Now this is Carberry, this is uh, the McCarthy's Rake area, and they're seated in and around Kilbritton. So whereas the McCarthy's more have a supremacy over this whole area of southwest Munster, including most of West Cork and, and Kerry in today's terms, the McCarthy's Rake are kind of in and around, based in and around the Kilbritton area. So this is a picture of Spanish fishermen. Now this is actually in the Basque country, but what they're take, doing is they're taking in, they're salting the fish. Now in Ireland, the great legend of the south and west of Ireland is that people have dark hair and so on because of the Spanish Armada. Well, if, if it is because of a Spanish influence, it's because there was hundreds of years of interaction on the south coast of, and west coast of Ireland with Spanish fishermen and Spanish merchants. Um, so the McCarthy's Rake, for example, took a tax, a regular tax off the Spanish fishermen on the coast. Donald's cousin, or sorry, Florence's cousin, Donald the Peepee. Now this is the second Donald in the story. The first one is the last McCarthy Moore. Then there's Donald the Peepee, Donald of the Pipes. How did he get this nickname? Because a Spanish uh, ship carrying pipes, uh, uh, pipes of wine is how it's described. I'm not sure what that means, but pipes of wine gets wrecked off the coast and Donald leads his men down and he loots it. And, and he distributes the wine. So Donald gets this nickname, Donald of the Pipes. But Florence is also educated, and here's where it starts to get interesting. Florence is educated by a priest, McKeegan. Now Thomas talked in the last talk about how this Gaelic elite, they're starting to lose their place. They can't get educated in, in Protestant England anymore. We're starting to see them going across to Europe and being educated in the Counter-Reformation. So McKeegan, who was one of Florence's early tutors, uh, teaches him Spanish. So from an early age, Florence McCarthy speaks Spanish. Now he also speaks Irish, vernacular Irish, Munster Irish, but also classical Irish. So this is the, the language of literature, which most ordinary people didn't speak. And he also spoke Latin. Now, not English yet, that'll come a little bit later. Um, throughout his life, he had correspondence with, now this is, it's described in a Latinate version of an Irish name. So Dermot McCarthy in English, Dermot McCarthy in Irish, but in, it's Latinized in Spanish as Dermutio Carty. So he's a kinsman of Florence, and he's in Spanish service throughout his life, and Florence is in correspondence with him throughout his life. Now, this is kind of an overview of Ireland. As we see, like, the McCarthy Moor area is, is depicted here as kind of a monolith, which is not at all, but basically this is the area we're talking about. Now, okay, why is this, where does Florence fit into the wider picture? I'm like, gonna have two zones of context. First one is 16th century Ireland. So in 1542, Henry VIII claims Ireland as a kingdom, not a lordship as previously as a kingdom. So this means they're going to establish the actual control of the, technically it's the state of Ireland, the kingdom of Ireland, but the, the English kingdom of Ireland over Ireland. They have to control it, they have to establish their laws. They have a thing, which I'm sure we all learned about in school, surrender and regrant, which is how the Irish lords surrender, they become subjects of the king, they get an English title. So for example, McCarthy Moore becomes Earl Clancarthy, in theory. Now it doesn't work out very well. One of the main reasons for this is that the Irish lordships are so fragmented. So the English back one candidate and they expect his son to be the next Earl Clan Carthy. And by Irish custom, that doesn't work out because there's many different candidates from all the different lordships. They have to be selected from within the area. So what the English tend to find is when they back one candidate, they're immediately dragged into these factional battles with another one. As we'll see in Florence McCarthy is exactly what happened. But as the century goes on, the English increasingly turn to what they call a work to military force to advance what they call the civil reformation. Now the religious reformation of course exists in Ireland, that the Church of Ireland is established, but much more important in the 16th century as opposed to the 17th century is that what they call the civil reformation. By civil reformation what they mean is establishing English law and English language throughout Ireland. In Munster, the first, the first real impact of this the use of military force to do this is the Desmond Rebellions. Now, I don't have time to get into it, but essentially the Desmond Rebellions are a dynastic revolt, really, by the Fitzgerald family, who owned most of, a great deal of, of Munster. The Fitzgeralds of Desmond are squashed. They're squashed with great brutality. Um, but they also get aid from Spain and from the papacy during this rebellion. Shortly after this, the first Irish regiment enters Spanish service in 1587. Now, at the time, I got into in a second, this, as I said, is part of a European 
kind of a cold war between Catholic and Protestant. And the circumstances of the Irish regiment are that they are sent to the Netherlands, where the Spanish Netherlands is revolting against Spain, and they defect. They de they're sent to the, to the Spanish Netherlands on the English side. And under two English Catholic officers, actually, they defect to the Spanish. So, specifically, specifically here, the Munster plantation is, is what Florence has to deal with as he's growing up. So Florence, as remember, is born in 1560. He's coming to maturity around 1580, which is the end of the Desmond Rebellion. The McCarthy's actually cited, and certainly the McCarthy's wreck, sided with the English in the Desmond Rebellions. So Florence, who is a young man of about 20, he aids the English and he serves with two officers, William Stanley and Jack Di Franceschi. Jack Di Franceschi is, is an Italian, I believe, by origin. But these are the officers who defect later on from the English side to the Spanish side in the Netherlands. Now, Florence serves with them on the English side in the Desmond Rebellion, but he's haunted throughout his career by these accusations that he served with these traitors during the Desmond Rebellion, even though it was on the English side. The McCarthy's initially come out of it okay, because basically they're dynastic rivals, the Fitzgeralds are squashed, they side with the right side, but they have a problem. All of the Fitzgerald land is confiscated, and a, a very acquisitive new class of settlers is brought into Munster. Um, the ones they have to deal with, at, for the most part, are a man called Valentine Brown. Valentine Brown was the surveyor of the Munster plantation, and he actually bought some of the McCarthy land off Donald, whose picture we saw, Donald McCarthy Moore, who was an inveterate gambler, among other things, and who had mortgaged his land. So their land, the McCarthy land initially, McCarthy Moore land, was not seized, it was bought by Valentine Brown. But for, throughout Florence's career, we're going to see Valentine Brown is a perennial rival of most of the McCarthys, and especially Florence. A loser in all this is, and I, this is the language of the time, so it's a bit Game of Thrones, Donald the Bastard McCarthy. This is the, our third Donald, okay? Now, Donald is the illegitimate son of Donald McCarthy Moore. Donald McCarthy Moore is the man who takes most exception to Valentine Brown arriving in South Munster, and he takes to the hills, and this is the, the phrase of, of the English at the time, playing Robin Hood. They don't mean taking from the rich and giving to the poor, they mean living as an outlaw and attacking the new settlers. Um, this is an image from the Desmond Rebellion. We see it's, it's a very brutal time, you know, with heads cut off, but, okay. This is, this is the last bit of context, and then we're gonna get into the, the nitty gritty, okay? Context two is the international context, okay. So, Philip II of Spain, who had a long reign, a long and bloody reign, uh, a war-filled reign, his long-term project was to detach England from the Reformation, to put England back into Catholicism, both for religious reasons, because he was a very devout man, but also for strategic reasons. So, in the 1540s, of course, he, he married uh, Mary, known as Bloody Mary, tries to reimpose Catholicism that way, that breaks down when he goes back to Spain. In 1570, the Pope excommunicated Elizabeth I, now, the Spanish uh, gave aid to the Geraldine, this, the Fitzgerald rebel rebels in the 1579-80. They're massacred in, in Samaritan County Kerry. Um, it's technically a papal expedition, but it's backed by the Spanish. But the, the big thing that causes war between them is English aid to the Dutch rebels. So the Spanish Netherlands is in revolt. The English aid them. English privateers in the Caribbean are raiding the Spanish ships. They're basically raiding the gold that's coming back from America. Now, I, I, won't get, I won't get into it in great detail, but the point is, the Spaniards from this point onwards until about 1603 are at war with the English. The English are a strategic rival. They're also an ideological rival, a religious rival, but the big thing is really geopolitics. And Ireland is important because Ireland is a way of getting at England. So in 1587, they considered invading Ireland as part of the Spanish Armada. The idea was to have a diversionary attack in Ireland. Now, that didn't happen. They actually sent a fleet in 1596, which was wrecked a little bit like the French in Bantry Bay 200 years later, and they sent a fleet to Kinsale in 1601. So the Spanish are thinking about Ireland the whole time, especially the south coast of Ireland. They're thinking about a way of using Ireland to get out of England. So this is all the context of Florence McCarthy. He's growing up. The English state is advancing. There's infighting between him and the English settlers, and there's also infighting between him and his relatives. And in the background is this much wider war between Spain and England. Now, in 1588, now, okay, I'm sure you know this. What happens in 1588? Spanish Armada. So Florence McCarthy, who speaks Spanish, who is addicted to the company of Spaniards, as they said. Um, in 1588, he is also engaged to be married to Ellen McCarthy, the daughter of the McCarthy Moore, who was 14 at the time, incidentally. But 
The English authorities in Munster, Warham St. Ledger's, the governor of Munster, the Lord President, is alarmed by this because this opens the prospect of uniting the McCarthy's Reich and McCarthy Moore dynasties. You'd have a McCarthy chieftain who could command the loyalty of all the people in this area. They, ca they calculated he could get a, a, an armed force of about 5,000 men. It's a big risk to this, this idea of a civil reformation. So they forbade the marriage. Um, the other thing, the context is the Spanish Armada. So everybody knows a Spanish invasion or attempted invasion is on the way. They know this guy has contacts with Spain. So Florence McCarthy is arrested, not on any charge. He's arrested at discretion. He can be held for as long as they want because they're afraid of what this marriage might mean, especially in the context of the Spanish Armada. He's held, it, he's held first of all in Dublin, where he meets, among other people, the young Hugh O'Donnell. Uh, and then he's held at discretion in the Tower of London. And this is a 16th century depiction of the Tower of London. So Florence McCarthy, remember, starts out on the English side, fighting for the English in the Desmond Rebellion. But now he's getting arrested, not because of what he did, but because of what he might do. Now, in London, there's a series of kind of complicated charges. Now, they're, they're brought both by the English authorities, but more much more importantly, really, by his local rivals, especially the Barry family. Now, the Barry family had been rebels in the Desmond Rebellion, but we're now trying to kind of counterclaim against the McCarthys. So the charges are from the Barrys and the Browns, who, who were settlers, that he had correspondence with defectors William Stanley and Jack T. Franceschi. Remember, these are the two English officers who brought over an Irish regiment to Spanish service. The second thing is that he's in correspondence with the Duke of Parma. Now, the Duke of Parma is the commander of the land forces of the Spanish Armada. It's not clear if this is true. He most probably was in contact with Stanley and DeFranceschi. With Parma, we don't know. It's a very serious charge. Um, but the, the minutiae of the remaining charges are very interesting. And again, what they show is the extent of Irish involvement in the Spanish world and the extent of Florence's contacts with these people. He's accused of, contact with, he's accused of correspondence with William Hurley, who's a professor at Oxford. Uh, Cormac MacDonald McCarthy in the Spanish army, and Dunna McCarthy, his base brother, this means his illegitimate brother, who was in England, Fiona McCormac McCarthy, who was sent to Stanley in Brussels, so Brussels is a Spanish possession at the time, it's the Spanish Netherlands, and Owen McCarthy, recently returned to Carberry from the continent. Now these are really extensive and high level contacts with the Spanish world. None of them could be proved, which is why he's held at discretion, but the level of them is interesting, the fact that they're credible is interesting. So Florence denied everything, um, he says, he says, there were people of my country in name but, and akin to me far off. Nothing could be proved. Um, the authorities in England at the time are relatively impressed with him. They, they like the fact that he speaks English. They, they find him a civilized man. He lives in, in London for a number of years. He's released in 1593, so he's, he's held in prison for four years. Some of it is under uh, kind of house arrest in London, so it's not all in, in the terror. Um, actually, it's lobbying by his powerful Irish allies, the Earl of Ormond, who gets him released. But his troubles are only beginning. He comes back to Ireland. There's, his first and most serious problem, and apologies for the, you know, the confusion of all this, but his first and most serious problem is not necessarily with the English, because you know, they've released him now. It's with D base Donal, or Donal the Bastard, as Florence calls him. Now, this is a rival claimant for the McCarthy Moore title. Ri Florence has married into it. He's married Alan McCarthy. But Donal, the illegitimate son of the Earl of the McCarthy Moore, says that he's the, he's the correct successor. And Donal, remember, is the outlaw, the bandit. He's living in the hills of West Cork. And he's fighting what essentially is a guerrilla war against the settlers, yes, but also against Florence. There's a legal feud with the families, the Barrys and the Browns, who are the people who made all these allegations against him. And there's marriage troubles with Ellen, his wife, that wicked woman that was my wife, as Florence later calls her. And the problem is, this is interesting, is that Ellen thinks she's actually above Florence in rank, because Ellen is the daughter of the McCarthy Moore. And she says, who, who is this guy who thinks he can be McCarthy Moore? Like, I, I, these are my lands. And if they're going to be, if under English custom they're going to be parceled out and there's going to be legal title, it should be for me. So um, we're going to, this becomes much more important later on, but at, in the early 1590s, there are already reports coming back to the English that Ellen is basically informing on Florence. And Ellen is refusing to go to his bed, this is the term they use, refusing to go to his bed until he comes to terms with the English because she says, I am not willing to go a begging to Ulster or to Spain. So Ellen says, you can forget about this rebellion stuff. You can forget about you know, waiting for the Spanish to invade. I want a settlement now, and I want the legal title. Now, Florence spends most of his time actually not so much in, in, in West Cork as in London and in Dublin. And he's lobbying to be made McCarthy Moore by English title, Earl Clancarthy. But then the next crisis arrives. It's a nationwide crisis, the Nine Years' War. Now, the Nine Years' War, I'm sure you've all heard, is initiated in Ulster by Hugh O'Neill and Hugh O'Donnell. It becomes a nationwide war. Now, for my money, this starts off as yet another dynastic war. It's a war of 
of these particular lords with their particular grievances against the crown, but it becomes something more. Hugh O'Neill sends manifestos basically to every corner of Ireland. He gets, he's him and he and Hugh O'Donnell are in contact with the Spanish from an early stage, entering, as I said, this international kind of cold war or hot war. Um, and the Spanish backing is there from the start in terms of arms, in terms of money, and eventually in terms of an expedition. Now, it breaks out in 1595. It arrives into Munster in 1598, after the rebel victory at the Battle of the Yellow Ford. The Battle of the Yellow Ford is when an English army is trounced up in, in modern uh, Armagh. And what happens is Hugh O'Neill sends mercenaries and allied forces into Munster. And within two weeks, the Munster plantation disappeared. What the annals of the Four Masters say is there wasn't a single son of a Saxon left who was not killed or had fled within two weeks. But ever complicated 16th century Ireland, it also provoked inter-Irish as well as Irish-English conflicts. So the first thing is the Barry family, who remember had been in the Desmond Rebellion fighting the English, are now pro-English because they judged that they won't be, they're, they're not allies of Hugh O'Neill. Their land is ravaged by Hugh O'Neill's men. Uh, Fitzthomas, who is, again, another illegitimate son of the Fitzgerald dynasty, O'Neill appoints him as the new Earl of Desmond. So that naturally creates its own conflicts. And the other one, the one that's most important for us, is Florence versus Donald McCarthy. Remember Donald, Donald the Bastard? Yes? yes. Yeah. Illegitimate son of the McCarthy Moore? Yeah. Donald is recognised by Hugh O'Neill as McCarthy Moore. Hugh O'Neill, the new force in the land, right? Florence at this time is betting on the English, or so it seems. Florence says, I, I am your loyal subject. Donald the bastard is parleying with the rebels and so on. Um, but this is going to change. Now, what Florence initially does is he actually sends some men to serve with the rebels at the Lord President. So the, the governor of Munster sends men up to Ulster. Um, he, he writes that he knows O'Donnell. He knows Hugh O'Donnell because he was in prison with him. He says, O'Donnell and the rest of those fools are grown into such extreme pride and folly by reason that they have neither wit, knowledge, or experience to judge or wait Her Majesty's power that they stand upon great terms. Now, interestingly, this shows how well Florence speaks English, because this, this is what he wrote. Um, but, you know, Florence is writing to the English saying, you know, they don't, those fools don't understand that they have no hope of victory. Um, we now, you know, we, he's writing something else to, to the Northern rebels, actually. Um, he says he doesn't know O'Neill, he doesn't know O'Donnell, he says he can negotiate with O'Donnell, he can bring him round. He offers to use it, and this is, again, for our purposes of Spain. He offered to use his kinsmen in Spain to learn the intentions of the Spaniards with regard to Ireland. Now, the fact that Florence can do this, again, shows how extensive his contacts are. But the other thing is that this is utterly disingenuous because, because of his, his ties with quite high-level people in Spain, Florence knows exactly what the Spanish are thinking. They're thinking of an expedition to Ireland at the time. Um, Thomas Norris, who is the Lord Lieutenant at the time, as far as I recall, says to Robert Cecil, who is like the equivalent of the Prime Minister, he's on the Privy Council, really, of Elizabeth I, said Florence had planted two of his kinsmen among the Spaniards as spies and his, his suit should be given a sympathetic hearing. So Florence, again, is still lobbying to be made McCarthy more, but he's planted two of his kinsmen as spies. What if they were there the whole time? So Florence, at, at, at the start, he, he appears to be on the English side, but when Hugh O'Neill himself mounts an expedition to Munster in 1599, uh, as the annals again say in their poetic way, he, ca he came to reward his friends and to punish his enemies in Munster. He, Hugh... Uh, like, just like Florence, ever the pragmatist, disowns Donal immediately when he arrives in Munster because he, he realises Donal is the man up in the hills with a few men, but Florence McCarthy is where the power is. So he, over, overnight, Donal gets pushed out, Florence gets pushed in, but O'Neill now recognises Florence as McCarthy more, and Florence thinks, hmm, okay, and he changes sides. He goes over to O'Neill. He, he comes into O'Neill's camp, and he pledges allegiance to O'Neill on what he calls the holy action. So... Whatever, you know, whether we judge him to be sincere or not, what Hugh O'Neill presents this as is a war for Ireland and a war for the Catholic religion. Um, and the English reaction, again, is, is interesting. The Lord's Justice, which is kind of the ruling committee say, of Ireland, say, we that have known him longest did never look for other fruits of this Spanish heart. So we knew it all along. And we, knew we, would, we knew he was a Spanish sy sympathizer all along. So Florence has a, quite a brief period of, of war with the English. Um, there's an expedition, once the English realised he's changed sides, there's an expedition from Cork City under a man named Captain Flower. And, and the, you know, the warfare of the time is, is utterly brutal. This is a contemporary illustration of its burning a house, and this is what warfare, you know, consists of. So Captain Flower's men, they march into Carberry and they march into other McCarthy lands, uh, and they burn and spoil all such as are revolted from their loyalty. That's Captain Flower's report. So they, they go in and they burn the villages and they kill the cattle and they kill the people. 
And Florence says they did nothing but burn three castles of mine and kill every man, woman, and child they found in them. Which, which Flower also says, he says, we did kill many of their churls and poor people. And, you know, we says that without shame. But that's the warfare of the time. Um, McCarthy's forces intercepted Flower on his return journey. So he goes into West Cork and he's coming back over the River Bandon, probably somewhere near the town of Bandon. And there's a pretty stiff fight there. There's about 100 killed on both sides. Um, George Carew then arrives in Munster. Now, George Carew is someone, who, someone for whom I've kind of backhanded admiration because he's a very tough man, he's a brutal man, but he's, he's such a capable commander. He speaks Irish, among other things, so he's, and he understands the intricacies of local politics. Um, he arrives in Munster, he harried the rebel forces, he retook castles, he, you know, if you take a castle, you can kind of control the area. Um, he arrested James Fitzthomas, the Shugan Earl, so he's like Hugh O'Neill's Earl of Desmond. But he does something very clever, I have to admire him for this. He does, he, he backs Donal, remember Donal, the bastard, McCarthy? He backs him, right? So he's thrown out by Hugh O'Neill, and Carew says, okay, what's the one thing Florence is most afraid of? He's afraid of Donal. And he says, and, he, and Carew writes to England, I have gotten a bloodhound of his country to hunt him. <laughs> so, and Donal, you know, who's supposed to be the arch rebel, he has no problem with changing sides either, apparently. Um, so Florence comes into Carew once he adopts Donal, because this is a threat to his, his real agenda, which is to be McCarthy Moore. And Florence comes in, and he doesn't change sides again, not yet. Uh, he, he says he pledges neutrality. He says... You know, what he says is interesting. He says, the people of my country will overthrow me if I go over to your side. He says, but, but uh, allow me to remain neutral. And Carew says, okay. You know, Carew doesn't believe him for a second, actually, because Carew is convinced that he's you know, pro-Spanish and so on and pro-O'Neill, which is probably true. Um, but Carew says, if he desires to be neutral, we will let him do it for now. Um, this is Carew and Florence. Florence is by nature a coward and much addicted to his ease as any man living and therefore unmet to be a rebel. Uh, Donal, a veteran Woodcurn, a Woodcurn is like a bandit, uh, would be much worse if he was still McCarthy Moore. Um, and it was best to permit him to be neutral, which I suppose he chiefly desires, being at all times ready to join the Spaniards if they come, or return to be a subject if the rebels prevail not. So I think Carew is, is on the money here. Florence wants to back the winning side, but he thinks the winning side is going to be the Spanish. So Carew decides to temporize with Florence, so leave him alone for now, and to prosecute, go after Fitzthomas, the Earl of Desmond. Okay. What were Florence's real intentions? Now, this is, my, this is my opinion, but this is the conclusion that I've come to. It's to wait for Spanish invasion when he can be sure of rebel victory and not to be killed or dispossessed beforehand. So the rebels, interestingly enough, are writing to Florence the whole time and saying, why aren't you attacking Carew? Why aren't you crossing the Bandon River and attacking Cork City? And Florence writes back to them, oh, when, when the time is right. Um, what Florence wants to do is not expend his, his forces, you know, outside of his territory. He wants to consolidate his hold on the McCarthy territories, and he wants to wait for the Spanish, who are powerful enough to decide things. Um, so a spy of Barry's reports that he advised the Spanish landing in Cork rather than Limerick, which, of course, is, is handy for him, uh, because it would be easier to take, and it would force the local lords to take the rebel side. So again, it's his local agenda that's important. Um, he, Florence writes to O'Neill and O'Donnell up in the north to come down to Munster and for an early expedition. And, and O'Donnell writes back, we are, we are no more grieved for that you see us not than we ourselves. That's translated from Irish, but I like, I like the way it sounds. Um, most important, on the 5th of January, 1601, he writes to Philip II of Spain, the long-serving king of Spain, via his agent in Ulster, Dormac, Dunna McCormack McCarthy, another Spanishized Irishman, offering his person and lands, as well as his vassals and subjects, to your royal service, to receive favour and aid, seeing as there is no other that can and will assist us better against the heretics in this holy enterprise. Now, Florence McCarthy is a Catholic, um, but I, I strongly doubt that it's, it's his primary motivation. You know, he, he's, his motivation is to be McCarthy more. That's the foremost thing at all times. Um, his signature is also found on a letter to the Pope, which is signed by O'Neill and Fitzthomas, asking for the renewed excommunication of Elizabeth I. So when I was going back over my material, this is when I came to the conclusion, this is a man who, who really has bet on... on on a Spanish victory here. He wants, he wants to live in a Spanish-ruled Ireland, or at least a Spanish-dominated Ireland. Why? Because it can best consolidate his local agenda to be McCarthy Moore, which is what he's going after all along. It's the only consistent thing in his whole career. Now, of course, it doesn't... Well, no, there's, a, there's a kind of an interregnum period. He fights off any English incursions that come in. He doesn't send people out. He sends a ship from Kinsale to Spain, and he receives arms and ammunition. Again, you can't do this unless you have already really extensive contact in Spain. He writes, he writes to people to recruit more mercenaries. And Dermutio Carti, remember Dermutio, Dermutio Carti? He, he's the Irish priest in Spain. 
he writes to Florence in early 1601. This is correspondence that's seized by George Crewe later on. It's either, in, it's either in Irish or in Latin, or in its original form. This is the translation. It would be very necessary to be on your guard and not to trust yourself to the English. Now, this is at a time when, supposedly, there's kind of a truce between the English and Florence. For if ever again they get you into their hands, never more will you escape from them. This is what Dermot, Dermot McCarthy says, and he's completely right about this. Just before the Spanish landing at Kinsale, Florence is arrested again for the second and for the final time. So he comes into George Carew's camp for peace talks. Now he has protection against arrest. He has supposedly immunity against arrest, but Carew arrest, arrests him anyway. Um, and R Robert Cecil, who, who is a, the man he reports back to in London, says, he, essentially, good work. Don't, don't worry about the legalities. We'll think about that afterwards. Um, Florence is sent from, again from Dublin into the Tower of London. He's interviewed by Robert Cecil, who calls Florence, sorry about the typo there, Florence a vain and malicious fool. Uh, he said the charges against him would never be proved, and he told them that the Spaniards were going to land in Galway, which was not true, and Florence knew it wasn't true. And he must have hoped that his fortunes would be reversed when the Spanish did get around to landing, which they did a month later. The 21st of September, 1601, 55 Spanish ships were sighted off Cork, and of course they landed at Kinsale. Now, the, the local ramifications are what's important here for us. They included kinsmen and followers of Florence, Dermutio Carti, we've said, uh, Tig McCarthy and Cormac McFinney McCarthy. So McCarthy's we hadn't even heard of until now, turn up with the Spanish invasion force at Kinsale. So again, what this tells me is, you know, without knowing the Spanish side of the story, Span Florence and his kinsmen are in contact with Spain the whole time. Uh, upon their arrival, the Spaniards specifically demanded, specially demanded for Florence McCarthy. Uh, Dermot Moyle, which is Florence's brother, returns from Donal. Base Donal, Donal the bastard, changes sides again, goes over to the Spanish. Donal the peepee, who's Florence's cousin, he changes sides as well. He'd been on the English side now, goes over to the Spanish side. Um, Carew, as yet no other septs, like clans, are in rebellion, but the Carthys, the McCarthys and their followers, chief among them is Florence's brother. Now, this might have all worked out fine. This might have been the culmination of Florence's planning, except for the Spaniards and Hugh O'Neill and Hugh O'Donnell, the Irish, the Ulster Confederates, were crushed at the Battle of Kinsale. So it's, it's the end of all of Florence's hopes, because the Lord Mountjoy's forces decisively defeat them at the Battle of Kinsale. Dermutio Carty and, and another one, yet another one, Don Carles Carty, were captured and executed. So priests, Irish priests found with the Spanish were hung. Um, most of the local lords, of course, what did they do? They changed sides again. So do, the two Donalds, base Donal and Donal Lapipi, go back and say, oh, sorry, it was all a mistake, and they get forgiven. Um, Dermot Moyle is Francis' brother. He fights a guerrilla campaign for a while, but he's actually killed by some of his own kinsmen. He raids the wrong McCarthy's and takes their cows, and they kill him. Um, but by the end of the, after the Battle of Kinsale, the game is up. The rebels return to Ulster. They, the war there continues for several more years, but in Munster, the game is up. It's all over. Um, all of the local lords who had rebelled, they came in and were pardoned. The two most important ones, that's Fitzthomas and Florence McCarthy, they're in jail. And so Florence spends the rest of his life, so he's arrested in 1601, and he dies in 1640, and he never returns to Ireland again. In the early 2000s, I, I, I love this little detail, a scholar called Con Bottomer, some of you might know, uh, found inscribed in St. Martin's the Tower, the Tower of London, McCarthy Finnian, so Florence, McCarthy Finnian, son of Dunna, was put here on the 26th of August, 1601, without cause or reason, having been captured by treachery, and he was released in, left blank, because, of course, he was never released. Um, his lands were divided up under natives and newcomers, so one of the really interesting things about this is that whereas Florence McCarthy is, pun is punished severely, that's not the uniform story for all, after all this chaos. So the two Donalds, who I've talked about, they get land, having, been par having come in and asked for pardon. They get pardoned. Um, Ellen McCarthy, Florence's estranged wife, that wicked woman that was my, my wife, she gets land in return for her service having informed against her husband. Um, but Florence does not get forgiven. So probably because he's such deep contact with the Spaniards, the, the inveterate enemy of Elizabethan England. He doesn't get pardoned. He brings his four sons to live with him in London. Um, he, after about 13 years, he is actually freed to live in London. Uh, but, uh, you know, an indication of his continuing involvement with, with the continental Catholic Europe, he's rearrested in 1617 in 1617 because a servant of his, Take O'Hurley, who, who converts to Protestantism, alleges his correspondence with, again, Jack T. Franceschi. Remember the officer way back in 1687, 1587, who had changed sides and gone over to Spanish service. So these allegations are still dogging Florence well, well into the 17th century um, and helped to transport uh, Maguire and Catholic priests into continental Europe. So again, even in London, there's still a kind of a, a, an echo 
of what he'd been doing in Munster. He's briefly arrested again several more times, um, and, and he died in 1640. Um, so Florence McCarthy, to sum up, he can't call him any kind of, of nationalist. The, you know, nationalism doesn't exist at the time. He, he wants to be McCarthy more. That's what he wants. But his contacts with Spain are such, of such high and surprising level that I now think my, my renewed or my revised considered opinion is that Florence McCarthy was betting on a Spanish victory in the Anglo-Spanish War all along. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>